500 rupees, which may seem insignificant to you. But that's an example of a viral program. Now, there are many other things we did. There are many other things you can do. And the bottom line is, you are on the ground in Pakistan. You know what's going on. There are millions of creative ways. But you need to understand the right ingredients to make your business a success. You need to know which button to press. It's not about money. I could spend that same amount of money, 50 million rupees, you hurt your advertising put some ads on Geo, put some hoardings, 50 million rupees, gone. So it's knowing which of the buttons to press. And there's a famous joke. There was a contractor and there was some problem with a space station. It wasn't working properly. You've probably heard this. And they hired a, a contractor to fix the problem. So the contractor came and uh, he examined it. He found a screw. He made the screw tight, everything worked fine. He gave him a bill for a million dollars. A million dollars? You've charged me a million dollars? All you did was you came in or a screw ko apne do dafa, just spun the screwdriver. The bill said, knowing which screw to tighten was $999,000. The screw price was only one dollar. <laughs> you have to know which screw to tighten. And being here on the ground as entrepreneurs, that's your job. Finding out which screw to tighten in order to make your business a success, screw only costs a very small amount of money. Chief, please. Uh, at one time, you said you have to be mutual with investments. Being a mutual, sorry. Being mature with your investments. What is the thing, being a mature with investments? But any factor or something like that? Yeah, Deko, this is just human nature. If you day, you get $5 million. $5 million. They say, okay, use this to grow your business. Yeah, it's a It's good because it's easier to hire. I'm going to get high end servers. I'm going to buy the best software. I'm going to use Oracle. Oracle is a very good company, by the way. I'm not going to use open source because I want to use the best. I work with the half a million project at the office space to many spend at the FSA. Advertising at the young, we've got the money. Let's put a million in ads in Geo. In Geo is a very good news channel too, by the way, a great place to spend the money too. We're on Geo right now. Um, no, no, honestly. But as an entrepreneur, you don't have the luxuries to spend that kind of money. But if you're given that kind of money and you think, Chalo, let's do it, and you don't realize money, you're burning it. And if you're not able to generate it at a faster rate than you're burning it, what happens? It's happened to many companies. I can cite examples. Many. Many. This is a fatal mistake. You raise a lot of money, you hire 200 employees, pay them great salaries and benefits, give them cars. I can afford to. $5 million. If my revenue five years down, doesn't exceed the amount I'm spending. My burn rate, burn rate being the domestic average expenses in. Ab itne high ho gaye. Office rent mene le liye, 200 employees hire kar liye, advertising mere on air ja liye. And all of a sudden I find out, yeah, I can't make my payroll. Ye mere saath ho chuka hai. This happened to me. So that's what I mean, that when you raise funding, you have to be very mature as an entrepreneur and know how to spend it and where to spend it. Because it could be the worst thing for your business. You could close down the business. You could end up with a distress acquisition where you do all this great work and somebody buys you for $12. Chief, please. Sir, I have two questions. Uh, initial years, when you were not uh, earning any revenues, and you were free for the business ke basic expenses? Kaise meet ki hai? Matlab, was it your own money that was flowing in? Because obviously a business needs cash flows for its personal expenses. Well, so actually we were running another business. It was a social networking site, which is where the name of the company comes Naseeb. from. Naseeb.com. And that was very cash flow rich. It was great cash flow. So we were using that to subsidize the job business. And I had just moved back. I was, you know, I had done well. I didn't need to make a lot of money. So I could survive on a very small amount of money. And I think that's important when you're an entrepreneur, not having very high needs of cash. 
So we were easily able to sustain and subsidize it on the back of the business. Now Rosie's revenues are about nine times larger than the site that actually helped create it. Chief, please. Initially, years, early days, I have to say that you are an entrepreneur yourself. So, everything has to go right, right. First thing is you have to create a product that works. Product should be robust, it should have a fundamental value proposition. If you don't have a product that's up and running, that's not crashing, then there's no value proposition. So what the basic whatever product you're making, it should work. And it should be up. But that is a very small piece of the puzzle. What the, this is a requirement. Everybody needs to do it. All of you can do it. But that doesn't guarantee your success by a long shot. In the end, it's not the best products that win. It's the companies that can sell those products. <coughs> but if the product doesn't work, it doesn't matter how well you can sell, you won't be able to do any sales. The product should be stable. Uske baad, I think the most noble profession on the planet is sales. And we say that they are salesmen, any kind of sales. Is, uh, I, I don't do sales. Sales is the most important, it's the most noble profession for a business. Because that's the blood of the company, that puts the blood in the vein of the company. So companies that shy away from sales and don't build good sales ability will always fail. So sales is, I think, the most important aspect as an entrepreneur. You need to be a salesman. You need to be able to sell your own product and you can't be ashamed to be a salesman. You'll never succeed. Chief, please. Yeah, I have a related question. Uh, you mentioned that you had your first major sales meeting with the you know, HR of the leading bank. Uh, so, how did you actually go about uh, convincing them? I mean, you, you mentioned you had this major challenge when they all laughed and all that. So, how did you go about really convincing them? I you would like to know. We gave it to them for free. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you should also be aware of this. And this is another thing that I've learned and maybe can help you as well. If your product works and you can get traction in the market, you're going to make money. And it's, it's, it's a problem at times. You need customers to convince other customers to come. Uh, so if you're confident, and we were very confident, I knew, yeah, try it. I know that they will get success from it. They think they won't because they don't understand the business, online can understand it. You know, I'm talking to a person who's very seasoned in his business, but his email come to him from his assistant in a printout in a folder. So I know that once the business tries it, it will succeed. So let's let them have it for free. Let them realize the value. And once they realize and understand the value, then you can make a business out of it. One of our largest clients, I remember at that time, uh, we closed the deal with the U UN. All 22 agencies of the UN, we were talking to them, it went all the way up to New York with the sequence evaluation with the talking to 22 HR heads. I remember being in a room trying to talk with uh, that account, fantastic people, but they already had a solution that was working. So why should we switch to you? And in order to bring the UN, we spent about six times more money on meetings and to win that account than we finally made from them. But today it's a very healthy account from us. So we invested in our clients. We invested in their success because we know that if we're able to build a partnership long term, it's going to work for all of us. So you have to be aggressive. Chief, please. As a very successful personality, you know that you know that this is there are many types of websites which are just doing fraud. Just doing fraud. How can you how can you elaborate that careful? So, 
Sales is about trust. Business is about trust. If there's one thing you need to build with your customers, it's trust. Most important thing. And you know, I'm not going to give you a lecture on ethics and you know, Islam and all the morals. You already have that upbringing. This is not about that. I'm talking to you about business proposition, trust. You need to build trust. How do you build trust? And I think what you need to do is, when you talk about building trust, look at yourself and your friends and your family. How do you build trust with them? What is the equity you use to build trust with your friend? And basically, trust means convincing them and taking proactive measures to protect their interests. So they're convinced, okay, if I deal with this person, they're not going to cheat me. They're not going to cheat me. They're not going to steal my ideas. They're not going to steal my data. And they're not going to abuse the link we have made to overcharge them. And that's done through action. Online, you need to make sure that you are respecting their data more than you respect your own. So for example, we talk to banks a lot of times, and banks are very concerned, especially the new banks that work with us. Did you have IT systems? How secure are they? How are you doing the firewalling? Okay, we're a bank. And it turns out that the precautions that we've invested in from a security online perspective is far greater than the banks have protecting your money. So when we start explaining it, they're like, Acha, how do you do that, how do you do this? But we didn't have to make that investment. Okay? We didn't have to put up all the security layers and the firewalls and the software and IP tables and all of that kind of stuff. But we did. We did it preemptively because that's one way to build trust. Our, our industry is such in Pakistan that it's evolving. A lot of things happen. A lot of people try to take advantage and do things that are unscrupulous. My South Nikuj incidents with, in fact, BITB was very helpful to us when we first started. There was a few people stole the source code of our website and they launched a competing website. And then the, we had, in the high court, we had a case. It was tried to the high court. The BITB actually examined all of the source code, it went to the high court, and eventually we won. Horrible battle to have to fight. But in order to, one, you need to protect your interests. If somebody violates you and you turn the other way, shame on you. Shame on you. You need to protect your interests because if you don't, then you have no right to complain. And the other thing is, the other way around, you have to build trust. You have to make sure that your business is trustworthy and you go out of your way to protect the interests of your clients. This is the last question. We have a few hands up, uh, um, but, but I saw you first. You mentioned that like there were, you were going to touch on why you came back, so I'm just wondering what, what motivated you to come back. Mm. There are two reasons I came back. Uh, I'm very close to my family, and around the time I came back, my father was working in the UN in the Middle East for a number of years, and he was a professor. When he retired, my parents wanted to move back to Pakistan. I was doing very, very well financially. I was making a lot of money, and I was trying to convince him, come back to the US and live with me, we'll live together. He said, absolutely not. Our whole career, we've been dreaming about the day we're going to retire and go back to Pakistan. And they thought it was a joke because I had no way of making a living in Pakistan at the 